Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is time to start this regular meeting of the San Felipe Del Rio Consolidated and Independent School Board, School Board Trustees, today being Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. Madam Secretary, uh, this is a regular meeting, by the way. Uh, would you call roll for us? Yes, sir. Ms. Becky Luna Chavez? Present. Mr. Overfill? Present. Ms. Gonzalez? Here. Mr. Mesa? Here. Mr. Galindo? Present. Ms. Haynes? Here. And myself. Sir, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Let the record show that we do have a quorum of board members and that this meeting has been duly called in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. We will have opening ceremonies, first with a moment of silence for personal reflection, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please stand? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate your attendance here. We have a special recognition starting out with item four on the agenda. And I'll turn it over to Sandra Hernandez. We have Amy. Amy, Amy Childers. Amy this is the Texas Association of School Board Business Recognitions. Good evening, President Mesa, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. Businesses Standing Up for Public Schools is an annual recognition program established by the Texas Association of School Boards to celebrate the important support provided in local communities, express appreciation to those who stand up for schools, and encourage more businesses to participate in this sort of community service. The support of local businesses and other community organizations is vitally important to our district. These collaborative efforts yield creative, exciting opportunities for students as they advance their learning. The San Felipe Del Rio CISD Board of Trustees and Administration appreciates your support. At this time, as I call your business or organization, please come on stage to receive your certificate of appreciation. We're gonna start with 47th Student Squadron and the T-38 hangar, two-day shift crew. Eighty-six Flying Training Squadron and Laughlin Air Force Base 85th Flying Squadron. <laughs> Border Federal Credit Union. Brown Plaza Association. <laughs> Choppa's Bakery. CrossFit Del Rio. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Del Rio Police Officers Association. Del Rio High School Class of 1984. Exploring Paths Incorporated. Topia. Home Depot. Marcy Zertucci Cast Designs. Rev Cycling Studio. Rudy's Barbecue. Serape Unlimited. Sojo Seller. <laughs> Texas Department of Public Safety. The Nail Studio. Valverde County Sheriff's Office. The Standard. That is all. Thank you for your commitment to our district. Thank you, Amy. And, and once again, it's, um, we appreciate every business organization and individuals that assist us throughout the year with uh, donations and uh, in-kind contributions. Uh, everything helps. Um, and we appreciate that, and that's why they're being recognized, because throughout the year we have individuals and businesses that support every endeavor that we have here in our district. So again, thank you very much. Next item we have is item uh, 4B on our agenda, and that's National CTE Month presentation. Mr. Roger Gonzalez. Good evening, Mr. Mesa, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. CTE Month is celebrated across the country every year and is dedicated to exploring and learning about the amazing opportunities and benefits of career and technical education programs. February is CTE Month, and this year's theme is Celebrate Today, Own Tomorrow. In our school district, the opportunities for students in CTE continues to grow with additional innovative and specialty courses additional industry-recognized certifications, competitive and unique projects, 
and the additional of CT dual credit classes. There are student opportunities to develop skills, to be creative, to, be, to become college and career ready. In CTE, students will showcase their skills with opportunities to compete at the district, state, national, and even world arenas. Our CTE family is made up of 44 dedicated CTE teachers in six different campus locations, a, com a committed support staff, and over 3,000 CTE students in 21 programs of study and in 12 national career clusters. On stage is our CT student ambassadors, made up of senior students who represent our 21 programs of study. Each program of study falls under one of the following clusters, architecture and construction, arts and audio video technology, business marketing and finance, education and training, health science, hospitality and tourism, law and public service, manufacturing, STEM, and transportation. Our CT ambassadors promote our CT program throughout the school district and community with pride, and we thank them for their contributions. Thank you, CT ambassadors. As a token of our appreciation and support for our CT programs, we are providing you with a student-created charcuterie uh, board, specialized. Thank you to the school board and administration for the support of CT programs. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. We are so proud of our career and technology education program. Uh, our commissioner of education, Mike Morath, was here uh, last month and, um, was it last month? This month? Yep. Last month. And so we took him to go see all the things that are happening at the Career and Technology Education Center. It is amazing all the work that they do. And when you serve as an ambassador, these students go and speak to the students about their program to be able to provide those services for the incoming classes. And so they talk about what they do, uh, the responsibilities and all the work that they do. And of course, um, most of them receive a certification so that they'll be ready to work and maybe uh, fund their own tuition when they go above and beyond high school. So thank you again, students. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Congratulations. Next item we have is item five, citizens to be heard. We have no one that signed up. Uh, so we go on to reports. First item that we have is item 8A. Discuss the process and options for the San Felipe Del Rey CISD school calendar for the 2023-2024 school year. Idea Garcia. Good evening, President Mesa, Dr. Rios, members of the board. Every year we bring together the district planning and decision making committee to give us feedback for the school calendar. Once we have their feedback, we present it to the board for additional recommendations before we take it to the entire staff to vote on the calendar that they would like to hear. Yes, sir. Did you have a question? No, I was waving hello to Frenchie McCray. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So 
So in your board packet is a copy of the presentation. And in the first slide, we have a copy of everybody in the District Planning and Decision Making Committee. When we bring the committee together, we do discuss some parameters around developing the calendar, which must, uh, the calendar must include 187 teacher duty days. It must have 75,600 instructional minutes. It can include up to five professional development days, but because House Bill 3 requires 180 instructional days, there's no room in the calendar for waiver days. Uh, we also include two bad weather days into the calendar. And again, we don't have enough bank minutes, so we did identify some days that are considered holidays in case we need to make up those days, then we would come to work um, for instruction instead of having those holidays. Uh, the Education Code 25, Dot zero eight one one says that schools cannot start before the fourth Monday in August, but because we are a district of innovation, classes start the second Monday in August. We also let the committee know that teachers, uh, teaching staff usually recommends to complete the first semester prior to the winter break, and the four staff development days uh, before school starts and and usually it's just three because we have a work day and then also we have a day that is dedicated to convocation and then also the other half day of that day is for uh, meetings at the campus so it's really three days of staff development days that we have now the committee did request to have two days of staff development and then one day of rti However, because every time that a certification is going to be renewed, uh, we have to provide, well, the employee has to provide a proof of 150 hours of continuing education. And those are required by doing at least 30 hours every year. So if we reduce those professional development days anymore, it's gonna be difficult for the teachers to get their staff development. There's some districts like in San Antonio that request for the employee to do their staff development during the summer, but we want to allow that opportunity for our employees to do that during, um, before school starts. We also include three work days. We do honor Memorial Day as it's required by policy, honor Martin Luther King, and then honor Veterans Day as well. As I mentioned earlier, we do have to have 75,600 minutes in the calendar, but because we are uh, applying for House Bill 3, which reimburses the district for funds from summer school up to half the ADA, we also have to include 180 days, and this does not include any waiver days. This year, we um, asked the committee to consider April the 8th, 2024 as a holiday because there's going to be an Oasis of Texas Solar Fest, which is going to be an eclipse. And it's, uh, the city expects a lot of tourism to be here, so we do want to consider that as a holiday. So these are some of the common components in our calendar. July 4th, Labor Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving break, winter break, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, spring break tentative upon the college schedule, Good Friday, Easter, the Solar Fest, and Memorial Day. Some of the differences on the three options of the calendar is that option A is the last day of school would be Thursday, May the 30th, and graduation would be Friday, May the 31st. Option B, observation of President's Day, Monday, February 19th, last day of school, Friday, May the 31st, and graduation, Friday, May the 31st. Options 
see would be an additional day added for winter break. So then this would start February, I'm sorry, Friday, December the 22nd versus these other two calendar options have the actual 25th where we would start the holiday. And then last day of school would be Friday, May 31st and graduation Friday, May 31st. I know that this is a small print, but in your board packet, you have an actual copy of the three options that are being considered. And at this time, if you have any questions or any other recommendations to these three options before we take them to the staff for their votes. As always, we, we wanted to see if we could get as much input from the, the teachers, the, the staff, everyone involved, because again, uh, we try to give uh, some flexibility uh, for anything that else that we might have left off. So again, uh, the higher percentage of people that are surveyed, the better off we are. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Orfeld has a question. Anybody else? A uh, couple questions. Um, how is it that we've, the last couple of years we've been done by like the 20th or, or around there, but this coming one, we're pushing like all the way to the end of, of, of May. I think I'm confused on, on that as to, even though we're starting early mm -hmm. as a DOI, we're finishing later than what we have in the last couple of years. I'm lost on that, that's one question. Yes, sir. The calendar this, for this school year, the second Monday was the seventh, okay? Because it, it started, let me see if I have it here. So it, it was the, the seventh. This coming year, the second Monday is not until the 14th. So that's why we have to push it out to the end of May. Okay. Cheers. Um. And then the other question, uh, because I know it's been going around in the in the news, and I know other board members have have, have asked about it and stuff, and um, just so that there's a so the public can understand why we're not moving in this direction, uh, the four day school year uh, there, because I, I know a lot of tiny districts do it. And I know that we're much bigger than Winters ISD and, and stuff like that. So if, if admin could explain why, I guess that's much more difficult for us to do uh, as opposed to some of these smaller ISDs. Um, because I'm guessing they're still, they still have to follow the same minute guidelines, but somehow they're doing it in four days and having a, 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 a work day slash tutoring day on, on Fridays. So just so the public can understand, because I know I've been getting lots of questions. I know some other members have. Sure. Uh, Mr. Overfeld, members of the board, having a four-day week uh, has been talked about and, and applied at, at some districts. Primarily, uh, they're using it as a method of recruiting teachers, where you work four days a week and you still get paid <coughs> salary. The reason they're able to do that is because they just extend the day um, so that they meet the required amount of minutes. Anybody can do that. Uh, there's two major obstacles, three major obstacles uh, to implementing that. One, in a district that has as many student activities as we have, a whole lot of our teachers would still be working that fifth day. Mm -hmm. Whether it be practicing for an athletic event or fine arts activity, they would still have the need to do that, CTE, to get in the number of hours for, that the kids need uh, to, to meet their certifications. A whole lot of our employees would still be working that fifth day. Uh, the second piece is, there's, it's just difficult. We have a working community. Mm -hmm. It'd be difficult for those parents at work to find that daycare on that fifth day, on that Friday extremely difficult. And probably more important uh, for us, not wanting to even consider that, is that uh, 
the academic achievement for each student, we believe, would take a significant hit because there's only so much attention that the student has to give in a day. So we're extending that time where we want the student to be attentive, uh, yet the standards aren't getting any easier. So we know the kids aren't gonna be attentive for those extra minutes. But the standards stay the same. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. So for those three reasons, we would uh, prefer not to consider. Okay, and, and I, <clears throat> I appreciate the, the clarification, especially for those watching at home or, or, or who will look at it later. Um, Last thing I say is I, I like the, it, and of course it's up to the teachers and staff and everybody who works, like Mr. Ressa said, everyone needs to, to give their input on it. Uh, I think given that Friday before Christmas break is a big thing because of how close Christmas is that year, or next year, mm -hmm. I think we'd see a high attendance loss anyway for people who are traveling, so we might mitigate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comments, sir. Anyone else? Just my question would be, uh, so y'all, I'm gonna send it out to all the staff, how fast do y'all get it back and, and get the results in for that so there's enough time for them to plan and we, the parents to plan? Yes, we give them two weeks okay. and then just to get everything ready to bring to the board for adoption in March. Okay. So in March, because mm -hmm. I know that was one of the things that for parents too, how fast they get that calendar back so they can plan accordingly mm -hmm. to when they would wanna come, come back to school or they finish out school if they plan ahead of time. So that was just my only question, how fast back could we get that? Yes, sir. And again, I appreciate all the, all the work that goes into preparing the calendars and the different options, because again, um, yeah, we have to consider everything, like Veterans Day, for example, you know, such a, a big event here with our local community and, and everything else that goes on. And also we do look, as, as Mr. Uh, Ofeld mentioned, for good attendance, even though um, hopefully our funding will be somewhat different this year from the 88th legislative session, which I hope it goes into enrollment and not attendance, but that's to be seen yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Again, these are discussion items. Uh, next item we have is a report on facilities and construction update, Israel Carrera. Good evening, Board President Mesa and Dr. Rios, members of the board. I'm sorry. Are we striking B? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Dr. Rios. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you for Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mesa, our, our teachers uh, have their students take their benchmark exams, and we had wanted to make a report, but uh, through the weekend, some teachers were still grading some of the benchmarks. Uh, the data couldn't be uh, presented in a way that would make sense to the board. There's also some issues that our teachers will be working with. We all know that there is a new exam. Uh, the way our system records it, there are some questions, there's a problem with the way our system records it. There are some questions that might uh, be worth two points. But if you get it not entirely correct, the state of Texas will still give you partial credit. You might get one of the two points. But in our system, when we transcribe the answer code to DMAC, if it's wrong, it's wrong and you get no points. So to get an accurate report, we have to go in there and figure out how we're gonna give partial credit for some of those questions. So there's really two issues why we can't make the report today. One, they just finished the benchmark uh, late last week. Some people worked through the weekend, still haven't fully graded it. Uh, then we obviously have to review the data to make sure it's accurate. And then the second problem is again, the platform that they took the test and the platform that um, gives us the report on how many people passed, those two don't speak to each other. So we have to figure out how to work all that out. But uh, to our principals and the teachers that are here, just I, I know it was a lot of work trying to make everything work. We wanted the students to take the test on that separate platform so that they have what the commissioner is calling an at-bat to understand how the new test is gonna be and how difficult it's gonna be. So we gave them that at-bat and, and we're happy for it, but now we're trying to make sense of the data on a platform that isn't speaking to the Cambium system where they took it. So uh, again, principals and teachers, thank you for the work that you did and uh, there's just a little bit more work left, but we'll, uh, we'll keep moving forward. So we will provide an update as soon as we have it 
and then we'll make a public presentation uh, at the next board meeting, Mr. Marcel. Thank you, Mr. Rofel, for the reminder. There's two items that will be tabled tonight, and we'll come to the other one later on, but thank you again for that reminder. Okay, um, facilities and construction update, Israel. So we'll be going over the Sanisa Hills Elementary, the Delroo High School roofing replacement, and the Cardwell move to North Heights. In the Sanisa Hills Elementary campus, um, we got block installation ongoing. We have the EFIS installation ongoing, which you see there is kind of that stucco looking. And then number three, we have this uh, center block. They see these rods sticking up. We have a center block wall going there that will cover our trash containers there at, at the elementary. So this is one of our classrooms. We have approximately 50% of the classroom have the first coat of paint. Um, electrical and plumbing and HVAC continue to progress. Uh, the drywall installation is ongoing. It's approximately 85% complete. And then we have the interior installation ongoing, which is approximately 99% complete. The Delroo Del High School roofing is um, the demo is completely done. They're 99% complete. They'll have the inspection tomorrow, so they should be all done tomorrow. Then the uh, car will move to North Heights Elementary. We have the following. We have the exterior paint. The paint has been ordered and painting scheduled for March 13th and should be completed in May 15th. Uh, additional circuits for sinks, work ongoing during the weekends, uh, portable sinks added to the classrooms, ordered and scheduled for June delivery, replacement of toilets ordered and scheduled for May delivery, lower restroom sinks uh, scheduled for the end of the school year, interior painting also the end of the school year, uh, parking lot in expansion will be done during the summer, and then the playground park is planned for during the summer break. Then enclosed uh, hallway construction is during the summer break and ongoing after that during the school time. Then the new furniture will be taking place between July 17th and July 30th, 2023. Any questions? Board members? I guess I, I uh, just want to reassure uh, on the Sanisa Hills. <clears throat> I think uh, the last meeting that we had, we have a, um, a change of order, um, work order, that we added some addition. Dr. Rios, some funding, additional funding? Yes, Mr. Ressa, the, the last meeting we uh, did the change order for the playground in the, in the back. Uh, so we did have to add some more money to the construction budget, but not to the overall budget because that money was a combination of the money that was donated by the city and then some of the contingency money that we had. However, we had to make that award to the contractor so that they would begin the work. Uh, we feel confident that everything will be done uh, completely before the, the start of school. With, with enough time to move in and everything else that goes with that, giving uh, the staff that's assigned there time to go in and make their room their own where they don't have to wait till the first, uh, first day of school or the first work day. So we're, we're confident that everything, it's a lot, but we're confident that it's gonna get done. Do we have any timeline in regard to the city uh, with their assistance on the park? No, sir. They gave us the money. We're managing okay. that money in the construction. That's why we awarded the extra funds to JP Sciences Construction, so that they would get it done as part of this contract. Okay. So um, there's no timeline yet on that? Uh, well, the timeline is uh, the, the end of June, I think, is a revised timeline. Uh, Mr. Chapa, that you were working with him? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I just want to make sure that it, uh, everything's complete and fenced off and so forth. Yes, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much, sir. 
or go on to maintenance? Yes, maintenance. The work order report. Our maintenance work order reports to zero to 15. Uh, submitted were 488, closed were 383 for 78.5%. The 16 and 30 days, <clears throat> 144 were submitted, 120 were closed for 83.3%. Uh, the 31 to 60 days, 1,100 were submitted and 853 were closed for 77.5%. And the 61 to 90 days, 46 were submitted, 31 were closed for 67.4%. For technology, zero to 15 days, seven or 1,772 were submitted, 1,675 were closed for 94.5, 16 to 30, 215 were submitted, 184 were closed for 85.6%, 31 to 60, 1,545 were submitted, 1,476 were closed for 95.5%. And the 61 to 90 was 33 submitted, 12 were closed for 36.4%. And last but not least is transportation. Zero to 15, 138 were submitted, 121 were closed for 87.7%. Uh, 16 to 30 days, 23 were submitted, 17 were closed for 73.9%. And 31 to 60 days, 25 were submitted with 23 closed, 92%. And 61 to 90 days, 41 were submitted, 39 were closed for 95.1%. Questions from board members? Dr. Rios, I have a question here in transportation. Again, uh, we have an item later on on the agenda for the purchase of 19 buses. Um, what will happen with the current buses that we have that will be replaced? Mr. Russ, I, we asked that specific question. And um, according to the agreement that we made, those 19 buses have to be decommissioned. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have to pretty much drive a stake through the motor to make sure that they're not used anymore and they're put entirely out of commission. So we are taking the oldest buses that we would have to replace anyway. But the idea is to limit the emissions and the only way you limit them is by putting them out of commission. So we're gonna get brand new buses, but uh, the transportation director is required to decommission the other buses. We're, we're not gonna sell them uh, or give them to another district. That's all part of the grant. So it's like the old um, <coughs> cash for clunkers. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> They, they did allow us, though, to take whatever parts that we needed that were still, they allowed us to take those from those 19 buses. And the reason I was asking, because again, 19 is quite a bit, but again, um, some of these buses are still in circulation, so I'm thinking, you know, government spending, we could do something with selling or trading off, I don't even know, but to decommission, it's almost saying we're gonna junk these, or scrap, but I guess that's the way we deal with federal grants. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next item we have is a report again. Item eight D attendance zones rezoning update. Dr. Rios. Uh, yes, Mr. Mesa. I'm going to speak to the first couple of slides. And then I'm gonna ask Sandra for help taking us through the rest of the presentation. I'll tell you what, Sandra, help, help me out. You just sure. do the first one and, and I'll speak to the uh, second and third, so I third will. or fourth slide and you take it from there, okay? Yes, sir, I will. Good evening, Mr. Mesa, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. What you have on this slide is the board policy with regard to school attendance zones. And the board policy indicates, indicates that the superintendent establishes the school attendance zones that will provide for an equitable distribution of students across the district. So the purpose is for, um, for, for us to maintain the neighborhood school concept. It's to eliminate overcrowding. 
simplifying attendance assignments, allowing for future growth, and keeping distances traveled by students as short as possible, and minimizing student transportation, and then finally allowing campuses to house students safely and to provide adequate student services to all our students. So we do have more policy that speaks to um, the attendance zones, the school attendance zones. is now with the development of, we have a new school that's just on the horizon of opening up in the fall. It's time for us to start thinking about school attendance zones. And this is the policy that speaks to it. So um, we did engage with the school, with the demographer, if you recall, a few months back, in anticipation for um, the uh, zone study, we, st we took a look at the, the school zones. We met with Zonda Education. And in looking at the district, we had to look at a couple of things. We had to look at the projected enrollment patterns for each school. And we need needed to look at the student demographic information. So looking at this chart, looking at the very top line, you see the student count by zone. So working with the demographer allowed us to look at the school attendance boundaries and then start adjusting them so that we create a balance. If you go back to the policy, it's about equitable distribution. And that was our main priority, is, just to, is to begin with that idea so that we would have an equitable distribution. And you'll see at the very first row, you'll see with this distribution, we were able to manage Sinisa Hills at 531, Buena Vista at 577, Lonnie Green at 650, North Heights, which is a pre-K, is anticipated at 650, Garfield, 661, Calderon, 613, Lamar, 618, Ruben Chivira, 585, and you see Bobby Barrera with 67, but I want you to think about that as we have our military families PCSing in and out of the base, um, you're going to see um, a, um, this, this enrollment number uh, jump to about 150, or at least close to 150. So we'll see that over the course of the summer. Uh, pretty much at the beginning in the spring, we'll start seeing some movement with that particular campus. Um, uh, the line underneath it is just kind of giving you a general idea of the building capacity and then the LEP count. And so I'm going to swap over to uh, or ask Dr. Rios to talk a little bit more about the LEP population. Thank you, Sandra. The next slide depicts of the population by attendance zone right now. I wanted to just share with the board that over the past few years, we've had bilingual academies at Garfield, Lonnie Green, uh, Buena Vista, and Chavira. If we look particularly at the beginner and intermediate numbers, um, we see the larger concentration of students at Garfield, Lamar, Ruben, Chavira, and, Lock and Lonnie Green. The students are, are there and they live in that attendance zone. What we want to propose um, moving forward is that we no longer bus kids from one side of town to the other, uh, but instead build up the <coughs> bilingual academies at the campuses uh, where, where they're at. Besides saving them on time for transportation, we will be able to see the students progress from beginner all the way through advanced high at the same campus. Garfield, Lamar, Ruben, Chavira, and Lonnie Green uh, would be the natural uh, bilingual academies where we would put the same resources in terms of the uh, instructional aids and, and the bilingual strategist. We have a fifth strategist that would primarily spend their time at Calderon. We would also provide some instructional aids at Calderon. And then we would look to support Buena Vista and Sinisa Sen Sen Hills uh, primarily with their uh, beginner and intermediate population. Uh, but uh, that would be a change from what we do, uh, what we're doing right now, but the way we've balanced the numbers uh, really allows us to do that, and, and that's something different that we want to do this coming year. Uh, if, uh, we'll have, we, we can have questions now or afterwards, Mr. Mesa, when we're done with everything. I guess we'll wait for the, uh, the, the end of presentation. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. 
So I'm going to draw your attention on your laptop. You have uh, the attendance zones are, are downloaded by campus. And this will allow you to click on the PDF and then zoom in and zoom out as you wish as I'm going through the presentation. But this first one is uh, just giving you uh, an idea as to, as to the process that's involved for the attendance zone study. So our first consideration is to consider that early college, uh, excuse me, the ECPK program uh, from Cardwell to North Heights. We have to think of them first and what that transition looked like. And then look at the redistribution of students, uh, elementary students who are attending North Heights currently and uh, place them in the surrounding campuses closest to the proximity of their residential area. So we use that as a two-step process first. And then that second consideration, that next level consideration, was then adjusting and redistributing the remaining elementary students equitably in accordance with their attendance zone. So we started with PK, then North Heights, and then looked at the remaining campuses, and then looked at boundaries, and then made those adjustments. And again, the key thing is equitable, to be able to be as close as equitable as we can possibly can. The first campus is your Sunisa Hills Elementary, and you'll see that what we've done is created a border around the area that will give you a general idea. And so the Sunisa Hills Attendance Zone encompasses the area north of Crestline onto Bedell Avenue. I'm going to try to see if I can get this zoned in. Whoops. Just going to not going to work with me, but it'll work with yours because yours is, uh, this is on a PowerPoint, yours is you can actually manipulate it. So the area north of Crestline onto Bedell Avenue and 17th Street, east of Veterans Boulevard, and then north of Chevrolet Drive and Amistad Boulevard, east of Kingsway, and then north of Quail Creek Drive. You'll see this area is the area that now pertains to Sinisa Hills. And Sinisa Hills is the file that's labeled CH. Give you a little chance to take a look at it. We'll proceed. Okay, so let's take a look at then Buena Vista Elementary. Now we see this attendance zone has then been shifted. The attendance zone encompasses the area south of Quail Creek Drive and then south of Amistad Boulevard, the area west of Veterans Boulevard to 15th Street, and then Crestline <coughs> on to Bedell Avenue and 17th Street east of Veterans Boulevard, and then north of Chevrolet Drive and Amistad Boulevard, and then east of Main Street to Mary Lou Drive, and then the area west of Keys Way and Sabrina Drive. Okay. 
The Lonnie Green Elementary Attendance Zone encompasses the area west of Veterans Boulevard from 10th Street to 17th Street and the area south of Sabrina Drive and Cantu Road. It encompasses the Cienegas Terrace residential area to the Duck Pond and Hilda Circle. That's just a slight adjustment here. Then moving on to Garfield Elementary Attendance Zone, it encompasses the area west of Veterans Boulevard from 10th Street to 7th Street and the area west of Main Street to the Industrial Park neighborhood and the residential area surrounding Garfield Elementary south of the railroad tracks and west of Main Street. The residential area that's along Las Vacas Road and south to Alderete Lane, down here. The Dr. Fermin Calderon Elementary Attendance Zone encompasses the area east of uh, Veterans Boulevard from 17th Street to 7th Street and the area east of Bedell Avenue and north of US Highway 90 East. The Lamar Attendance Zone encompasses the area east of 7th and Main Street to Bedell Avenue, the area south of the railroad tracks, west of US 277 to Alderete Lane, and then the neighborhood south of Alderete Lane. The Ruben Chavita Elementary Attendance Zone encompasses the area south of U.S. Highway 90 East and east of U.S. Highway 277 South and the neighborhood south of Garza Street and west of San Felipe Memorial Middle School. And certainly the Roberto Bobby Barrera Elementary STEM Magnet School in, uh, Attendance Zone encompasses the residential area within Laughlin Air Force Base. Okay, questions? Dr. Torres? Sure. Senator, appreciate all the work that you helped us do on this. Can you go back to Buena Vista Attendance Zone? I, yes, sir. I heard you say Bedell Avenue and I just don't know of a Bedell Avenue anywhere near Buena Vista. Did I hear it wrong? Uh, it's Crestline up here. You can show me uh, with the cursor. Okay. Oops. I'm going to borrow Mr. Smith's computer here. This one's going to give me a hard time. And this is this area down here uh -huh. along Bedell. No. Just this very short distance right down at the bottom. That's better. <clears throat> That's uh, that's 7UF. Yeah, that's Veterans. Bedell's yeah. going to be further east. Yeah, that's, that's Veterans. Excuse me, you're right. That that's is fine. We'll, we'll, Veterans. I just didn't want to confuse anybody <laughs> that who is might veterans. be watching at home. Okay. East of Veterans. Yeah. Okay. So many streets. <laughs> I will correct that. Yes, yeah, so that is east of Veterans. Okay. Yeah, that was it. You know, the, the maps are correct. Our descriptions, we, we, we That description the, is yeah. But incorrect. the maps are correct as they're depicted on it. Okay. Okay. Questions, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Rios. I, I, we have several questions. I want to turn it over to the board. But we always have a, a difficult time finding out how many kindergartens are coming in. Kindergarten students are always, you know, sometimes parents 
do I want to send them, um, do I send them to pre-K and hold off from K or, you know, it's difficult to, to determine like, the exact number. So what is the process? The, Mr. Bob Templeton, the, the demographer, you know, we give him all the information we have. Uh, he also does the, uh, what's that thing we do every four years, Sandra? Now I'm short on words. So we do a demographic study, but we also do um, um, the census. The census, okay, right? Census data is available. So he tries to gather as much as is available uh, to to make these predictions. The kindergarten numbers very well might be off uh, by a handful of kids, uh, but not drastically off. And, and every campus always sees a difference. They might one year they might have. You know, four classrooms for kindergartens, and next year they might have three or five, depending on the size of the campus. But it's always manageable. Okay. There, there are several questions that come to mind. Um, for example, Kelly Ranch, you know, subdivision has been developed on 277. Um, lots are going up for sale. Don't expect too many people to move out in that direction, but um, things to consider with the planning and zoning. And then the other thing is, um, just want to make sure that there's room in case, as I mentioned, kindergarten, that we have 50 more students and we need another classroom that we're not maxed out in regard to the planning zone maps. So, Dr. Rios, there will be some additional classrooms that are going to be available for yes. growth. Uh, Mr. Bresson, uh, Sam, can you go back to slide number three? So, if, if we look at slide number three and we look at the the building capacity. We don't have a building capacity for Sanisa Hills, but I know for a fact that we model Sanisa Hills after Garfield. So the, the building capacity there will be at least 850 students. Mr. Chapa? Okay. Um, it, so if you look at the difference between uh, the building capacity and the current student count, you'll see that everywhere along uh, the ways, uh, except for Lamar, which we know that's landlocked, there's plenty of room for growth uh, should we need five more classrooms. Okay. So we'll, we'll uh, now obviously it'll always take adjusting staff, uh, but there'll be, there'll be room for them. And we've ensured that every classroom at every building has appropriate furniture. Okay. Now I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Galindo, I had a question. Just to uh, clarify, so then in the attendance zone study, Dr. Fields, the lab count, that's included in the student count by zone already? Yes, sir. Okay, mm -hmm. so Sorry, it's not 531 plus 76, no, okay. And then the other thing is in this, in this study here, and it's a really good job, and I know a lot of work went into it, but is there a way that they were able to give you data as far as the mileage about how far? Because, I mean, I'm looking, and I'm going to use an example here, and I know it's not final, like Lamar. You may have kids in this Miguel Angel Greenway Lane and so forth, and the mileage to get to Lamar is looked pretty far. And so, was that taken into consideration? Because they may be closer going to Lamar, you know, based off of mileage, and if we're trying to do it by the close amount of close proximity of residential area, you know, did they give you more or less? I mean, how a mileage demographic on that? No, sir. Uh, not in this study, but okay. in the previous studies we did do for transportation. Mm -hmm. It's something that they could very easily do. The, the main focus was on the proximity to the campus, so they did study that, but okay. they didn't give us a report. Uh, the second uh, piece was on uh, keeping the numbers the same across the elementaries. Okay. But uh, we will get a, uh, a description of the distance because transportation needs that to be able to guarantee transportation to anybody who lives uh, two miles two outside miles. of the, the school attendance zone. Is it radius, sir? Is it radius, yes. Okay. And then I think Mr. Mesa pretty much answered my question when we're looking at the amount of kids to the size of the school and the amount of rooms to account for, you know, the extra rooms, or we've had some rooms that just completely maxed out the amount of rooms they had and they didn't have any storage, they didn't have anything this would pretty much take care of some of that as well then, based off what you're looking at initially with these numbers, you think? Yes, sir, with the exception of Lamar. 
the Mar uh, may have. They're almost at capacity. One or two rooms, uh, but they won't have many more rooms left. Okay. And then, if I may ask, Mr. Hernandez, would it be possible to get the numbers of what the numbers of what the student count was this year and what the new ones would be, so that we can have that included, please? We can begin to prepare a report for you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Price, can, can I do something real quick? Sure. Where is, God, I don't want to pick, no, she's not here. I'm going to pick on uh, Ms. Pond. Ms. Pond, what's, what's your uh, current enrollment this year? 765? Um, okay, so we're reducing uh, our larger campuses by about 100 students, and I think the, I think Buena Vista is a little bit bigger uh, by a handful of students, mm -hmm. but we'll definitely get you that report, we, sir. We will. Uh, but I think it's a, the point I wanted to make is we're definitely going to have a more equitable distribution. Definitely. I mean, looking at the numbers, yes. I mean, compared to I know Buena Vista is like at 780, Lonnie Green, like you're saying, 775. And, and my question as far as how many rooms and so forth, so we can try to get back to, you know, we have to move certain rooms or certain specialties back into normal rooms to give the principals and the staff back some of the areas that they would utilize and we thank them for using the space that they have but just so that way they can go back into a normal classroom and and, and some space that they had to give up to make sure that these kids are well taken care of just i would like to for that to be taken into consideration as well sandra one of the questions that comes to mind um well, I'll give, I'll give the board members an opportunity. Anybody else have a question? Because we, I guess I'm the oldest one here, but <laughs> I've been through this rezoning before. And there's a lot of parameters that, that we have to look at. For example, cafeteria staff, library books, furniture, and things of that sort. So I just want to make sure that the numbers correspond with the personnel that either serves lunches or librarian books, you know, that, all of that has to be taken into account, Dr. Rios. So uh, I just want to make sure that we have the appropriate personnel pertaining to the enrollment by campus. Uh, yes, Mr. Mesa, uh, we discussed it in uh, cabinet uh, just this morning mm -hmm. when we were reviewing this presentation and uh, Ms. Garcia is tasked with uh, visiting uh, first with the North High principal because of the staff that's transitioning over there and then uh, looking at all of the the staff uh, to make sure that there's an equitable distribution, uh, particularly in relation to bilingual certifications. Yes. And so it goes on with the same bilingual materials you know, and so forth. Yes, sir. So I just want to make sure. Uh, Mr. Galindo. Just one more question, Dr. Rios. The 22 to 1 ratio would pretty much be met all the way across the board most of the time? K through fourth grade. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? We're all done. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. I'm oh, sorry. Um, before we move on to the next presentation, the next steps for this is that now we'll make the attendance zones public, and uh, we will work so that parents are informed as to where their children are going to attend next year. It's going to be difficult. I recognize that a whole lot of Parents are going to want their kids to finish their fifth grade year because now they're fourth graders. However, here's what we have to keep in mind. We don't have a choice because North Heights students have to go to either Lonnie Green or Garfield. So we can't automatically make statements like you can finish your fifth grade year at Lonnie Green and not go to Buena Vista uh, because there may not be room. Blani Green is absorbing a lot of the North Heights students. Uh, Buena Vista has to absorb some of the Lonnie Green students. We will give parents a chance to ask for transfers, but because North Heights will no longer be in existence, we have to first accommodate 100% of the students there. The only, and I, I know this is gonna be unpopular, but the only transfers that we will immediately approve are only if you work at that campus uh, because the teachers go there and that's only a handful of students. Uh, but for everybody else, there is going to be a transfer request and that won't be reviewed until July once all the numbers have settled in. For that reason, Mr. Mesa, the, uh, the board policy was written by the state to just 
not make it uh, only make it a discussion item, not something that we vote because it's a whole lot of, of uh, people that are going to pull in one direction or the other. And we apologize for having to go through that, but that is a process when we close down a, a campus. The students have to be distributed. So we ask for everybody to be patient with us. I know that principals, now that we've made this public and we're going to start sharing it, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions, but uh, we will, as soon as possible, send out uh, letters where the campuses can, can hand to the students and we can also uh, email and, and however we can distribute to the parents as soon as possible so they know. Uh, and we will publicize a transfer opportunity um, later in the school year. And it is going to be difficult, but this is all part of the process. Okay. I just want to remind the board members that this is one of the topics that we'll have a full audience when we discuss this rezoning or cheerleader trials. <laughs> Just <laughs> wanted to throw that in. <laughs> okay, question. we're done with. Yes, Mr. Question. question. Oh. Yes, I, I just um, noticed in here. Turn on this is on. Um, will Garfield always have, or does it always have, a bigger concentration of LAP students? Yes, ma'am. That's 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 the area been. because of the area. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Anyone else? We're done? Okay. Thank you very much, Sandra. Next report that we have is item B, E, Strategic Plan Innovative Project, Sandra Hernandez. Mr. Rosa, I'm going to make that presentation. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, Sandra, can you just help me and I'll make it from here uh -huh. to save time? Is that okay? You can tell me yeah. to change the slides, sir, when you're ready. Mr. Mesa, uh, members of the board, Sandra Hernandez organized uh, all of the strategic plan activities. I'm going to ask her to just review for us uh, the first slide to just remind everybody the process that has, going, that has gone on and what has brought us to this point. Thank you, Dr. Rio. So uh, just to kind of bring you back to the strategic plan, this has already been almost one year of process. And, and through the year, we have done a lot of things. There's been a lot of action steps. And we began with community meetings. Uh, we went through three different campuses. We invited the community to come out. We invited parents to come out from every single campus to come in. And we became, um, uh, we began with proposing the idea, the what ifs. And in that, uh, in these meetings, it created a dialogue between parents, um, teachers, uh, and of course, administrators. And this was a very fruitful piece because in that piece, it opened the opportunity for our community to begin to share what, how they feel about um, how the ideas that we have and certainly they appreciated that we included them in that involvement process. We began the steering committee in April and May of, of last year. We formed that committee. We then uh, began to, uh, if you remember, the vision um, and the mission of the district. We started to look at the strategic planning processes and the areas that we were going to focus on as a district for the next few years. And then we came together and worked as teams and put together an action plan. That action plan was developed in May and June. There's a lot of work, a lot of uh, uh, participation. Again, we invited community members back to work with us, students worked with us, and as well as our, our teaching staff and our administrators together working on an action plan. We brought this plan to you for adoption um, in a board presentation last uh, in August at the start of the school year. We had, uh, we then rolled up our sleeves and got to work with it. And so the innovation committee meetings began um, they started to have discussions and started to talk a little bit more in detail about the things that needed to happen in order to 
uh, work with the innovative programs? What needed to happen? What do, you, what do we need to do? What do we need to be able to move forward with it? So those discussions happened, and then we rolled out another parent survey. So at first, we met with a select group of people that came in face-to-face -face back at those community meetings, but now we rolled out a survey to all of our parents um, from elementary, your, your K-1, fourth, fifth, and then middle school. And we asked them, what do you think? And so we had a great turnout. We launched that Thought Exchange survey in December. We had our innovative teams, committees, go and uh, conduct psych visits, go visit other schools where these programs uh, are at to get to see what it looks like and what it could look like here in our school district. And then um, we came together and did a debrief. And so I will tell you that that parent um, feedback was critical and supportive. And it basically said, we're on the right path. We're moving in the right direction. They're very appreciative of the innovative processes, the innovation and the opportunities for their children moving forward. And they're really excited about what's about to happen next. So this is pretty much in a nutshell the progress timeline of what has happened up leading up to this point. Thank you, Sandra. For the rest of the presentation, we want to talk about the elementary STEM program that we want to launch, the dual language program, creating a new tech middle school, a new tech high, and the P-Tech program that for all intents and purposes is already uh, moving forward. First, uh, let's uh, talk about the elementary STEM. What, uh, what we want to do with the elementary STEM is that we want to offer a K-6 program uh, at Sanisa Hills, Bobby Barrera Elementary, and Dr. Fermin Calderon Elementary. We want to begin this coming year with a kinder and first grade cohort. Uh, the cohort wouldn't be any larger than two classrooms per grade level per campus, and we would be using uh, locally developed curriculum that would be in alignment with TA's Texas STEM education framework. Uh, the reason we want to start out small is because it just, it's going to be a lot of work in developing uh, the curriculum, supporting it through our dashboard, through our resources, and training the teachers. Uh, obviously, we have to gauge how much uh, uh, student interest there is, but based on the survey, uh, there was just a whole lot of a whole lot of interest. I want to make clear that uh, students that attend uh, any one of the schools, except probably Bobby Barrera, because it's just a one classroom campus, just because you attend Sanisa Hills or Calderon, you're not automatically in the STEM program. Everybody would go through the application prop, uh, process. For the dual language program, uh, that's a K-5 program. That would be first located at Buena Vista, and uh, based on the interest, we would uh, also locate it at Lamar Elementary. Again, two classrooms per grade level, and it would be a locally developed curriculum that's also in alignment with TA's effective dual language immersion framework. Uh, that framework, however, hasn't been fully published, but we think it will be in the next couple of weeks. Our New Tech Middle School. The New Tech Middle School is going to be at San Felipe Memorial Middle School. It's going to be a sixth through eighth grade program, and it would begin here in August uh, 2023. However, for the first year, uh, it would be a school within a school. It would, it would just be a, a smaller cohort of sixth grade students that would be at that campus along with their um, fellow sixth grade students. Project-based learning, also based on the TEKS alignment with TA's Texas STEM education framework. And in the next few slides, I'll come back and talk about how the campuses would transition. And then a New Tech High School, the New Tech High School, think of the concept of, of, the, of, of the early college high school. It is a campus onto itself. And this would be a ninth through 12th grade program, It'd be approximately 150 students per cohort. It would not start until August 2026. The reason uh, that 
we would start that program is because at that point we would have fully launched the New Tech Middle School. And it's not that just those students that went to New Tech Middle School would transition to New Tech High, but it would definitely give us the time to appropriately build that program because it is a whole lot of work involved that has to be done by the people in the district. Same curriculum uh, based on the STEM education framework. Now the P-TECH uh, at the high school, it's not a P-TECH high school, but it's a P-TECH at the high school, uh, ninth through 12th grade, uh, the freshman the class of 2027, 20, 25 to 30 students. That uh, process is already, uh, we're already working to, to implement that uh, with the teacher certification, so we're excited about that. Now, I, I wanna spend some time talking about the transition because it, it is a, a little involved and it does take some decisions that have to be made here in the future. So first, for San Felipe Memorial Middle School becoming a new tech, it could be New Tech Middle School at San Felipe uh, Memorial Middle School, or San Felipe Memorial New Tech Middle School. This coming August, New Tech Middle School uh, would be launched as a school within a school concept at San Felipe uh, Memorial Middle School, sixth graders, cohort one year one. The following August, New Tech Middle School would expand and enroll sixth and seventh grade students, which would be cohort one and two. At that point, the uh, remaining sixth grade students would no longer attend San Felipe Memorial. We would have to um, either transition them to Del Rio <coughs> Middle School, which at that point would be a lot smaller, and through construction we could create a separate sixth grade uh, division, which would be in line with the sixth through eighth grade middle school concept across the state, or we could consider expanding uh, elementary to, to include six, uh, K through six. That's something that we have a year to discuss with uh, parents because we know that we can create a safe environment for the students at Del Rio Middle School for sixth grade students, but we wanna make sure that we have enough buy-in from everybody. If not, we wanna look at the other option. But it would be a much smaller Del Rio Middle School as well. Then in August 2025, we'd have a full cohort of six through eight. San Felipe Memorial Middle School would be a six through eight middle school, and hopefully Del Rio Middle School would also be a six through eight uh, middle school. Again, we'll spend ample time talking with parents about that uh, preference. Now for the freshman campus, becoming a new tech high school, in August of 2026, we'd have cohort one, and the freshman uh, early college high school students. Early college high school students um, at the freshman level already attend the same campus. And then Del Rio High School in that year would become a ninth through 12th grade campus that would serve first year freshmen uh, just the same. Then the following year, we now have two cohorts and the early college high school, the third year, three cohorts. And then in the fourth year, it's a standalone high school uh, that would operate pretty much the same way that early college high school operates. Uh, still participating in all activities uh, at, at uh, Delray High School, whether it be band or athletics, uh, everything would still be central to Delray High School. Now, we've done a whole lot of work, we've visited a lot of sites, we've had a whole lot of discussions, but now we, we need to, to begin seeing who the first cohort of students is, so we want to begin advertising uh, the plan. We want to make a presentation to all campus staff. Uh, Willard Jenkins, uh, who is, by the way, right now in the, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, receiving a couple of awards for his um, excellent work. Uh, he's working on a video to make this pre uh, presentation easy to all campus staff. Uh, also, the informational video for the community, begin recruiting students and staff. Again, it's a small cohort, so we're talking about recruiting a small number of, of staff to start that. And every year we would add uh, staff. Uh, and again, the program of curricular development, which would be tasking. But it's just exciting to be at this point and be ready to move with the launching of, the, of, of these programs. Our hope is that, that particularly with the 
case stem program that it'll be developed at a level where it can be implemented at all campuses. And I know that, for example, at Bobby Barrera, we call it a STEM magnet, but we were never uh, able to, to fully implement a program, uh, but they would be part of this. So uh, we look forward to that. So what's next? Um, we also want to make clear that at the, particularly at the New Tech Middle School, we can't have a New Tech Middle School that focused on project-based learning and then be able to provide all the bells and whistles that go with a comprehensive school. So we can't have a football team at San Felipe Memorial. We, we can't have a band. It's just, it's a specialty middle school. Now we do want to provide opportunities for students to participate, so having smaller programs like cross country and uh, maybe track, UIL competition, uh, basketball and volleyball, those programs, it, it, it works. Can we create an opportunity for kids to go to Del Rio Middle School if they want to play football and transition and participate after school? Absolutely. But as far as there at that school, uh, it'd be different. It'd be difficult, probably impossible, but we would certainly create those opportunities for students that want to participate. Again, I just want to reiterate that students who attend campuses where those specialty programs are, whether it be a dual language or a STEM program, aren't automatically in those programs. They have to apply. It's, uh, it's exciting, but again, just like the rezoning, there's, there's a lot of, of uh, information that has to be put out, but we're excited to be at this point, and we just wanted to update the board on, uh, on what's, what's next. Questions? I know Sandra and um, the committee has done a vast amount of work and, and it's exciting to see you know, what um, the survey results are and I think it's exciting to look forward to the coming years where we have uh, new and innovative programs that are available for, again, uh, securing, uh, securing uh, success in all our age group from sixth grade on up. So opportunities for them to, again, expand their knowledge and again we are we're so grateful for all the committee representatives um, and all the surveys that were done. Thank you again. <coughs> okay. Anyone else with a question? If not, we'll go on to the next report. Next item that we have is item eight or B um, I'm sorry, eight F annual SHAC report, Sandra Fernandez. And good evening once again. Mr. Mesa, Dr. Rios, and members of the board, uh, I am providing to you this evening an annual board update for the SHAC committee, which is the School Health Advisory Council. Um, we'll be covering a few things, the purpose of the SHAC, uh, membership, the meetings and we're required to share and post, uh, and the discussion topics, which uh, include the charge of the SHAC, the evaluation of the district's wellness policy and recommendations for the school health curriculum. So the purpose of the SHAC is established in accordance with board policy BDF and it's to ensure that we present our community values they are reflected on health education in our district. So the mission of the SHAC is to promote student and school employee wellness it's to advocate for a comprehensive school health program, and it's to serve in a health advisory capacity to the school board. These are our members, um, and so um, our committee members have been very, very supportive over the past couple of years, and they are uh, now finishing up the end of their second year term. Um, as a SHAC committee member, so we will be coming forward here uh, later in the spring to uh, present new board members for the upcoming school year. But they do a tremendous amount of work. They go over the wellness policy with us and provide us with some advice moving forward. So here's what we've been talking about over the course of the year. Uh, we needed to prepare, last in 2021, we were advised that uh, we need to prepare for new health education TEKS. The TEKS needed to roll out. 
and we needed to promote, promote student mental health, such as the Del Rio Cares Initiative and other support services that we offer in our school district, and increase parent and student awareness of the dangers of drugs and vaping in schools. And so um, these were three of the uh, priority topics that our SHAC committee wanted to prepare for for this coming this during this school year the other part is um, we're required every three years to conduct a triennial assessment and that is a compliance assessment and basically we review the wellness policy that was developed by the shack a few years ago uh, in fact this is the third year and we look at parent surveys and a parent survey was launched um, at the end of last school year, and of course, any audits that we have from um, USDE, our, our uh, food services, and things like that, we start looking at, at that information. We do a SHAC review and a debrief of the actual audit. We start looking at it, and then they provide us with uh, recommendations moving forward. What are what is it that we need to prepare for and uh, adjust for the for the coming uh, school <coughs> wellness policy because it will need to be updated. So the recommendations for improving the wellness policy are, of course, adjusting the language and the policy pertaining to school fundraisers in alignment with the USDE standards and implement the health curriculum in grades K-8 in alignment with the new TEKS requirements. Um, this, uh, at the start of this school year in 2021, um, the education code was updated and it changed the requiry, the uh, requiring the board to adopt a resolution. If you recall, we came in last December because um, we, the board needed to uh, recommend curriculum materials because of the new health teeks. And so it created a, a, a task for us um, and a task for um, our curriculum department to begin to research what was out there um, so that we can be prepared for uh, the teaching of uh, school health, but also the requirement of human sexuality instruction and the prevention of child abuse, family violence, dating violence, and sex trafficking. So the language changed in the policy, we needed to adjust it accordingly, and we've needed to begin research on um, the products that are out there that would help support the curriculum for our district. They, um, the curriculum department, had done that, has done that, and has done a tremendous amount of, of work and great job um, uh, with Mrs. Gomez and, and her team. They have researched and they have brought to the SHAC uh, proposed curriculum. And what is required is that we hold two meetings with the SHAC, we uh, present those, uh, the curriculum to them, we hold uh, the discussion or any questions, a Q&A, they have any uh, questions about it. And simply all it is is that we presented curriculum that is most aligned with the, the new TEKS. And so um, they did just that. They presented just that to our committee. And so now they are ready to make that recommendation. And this is the recommendation. They're recommending the CATCH health curriculum for K through eight. And I will say that um, for uh, the human sexuality instruction, making proud choices for grades four through eight, reproductive and sexual health, that will be, that is the recommendation. However, the curriculum is still under development. And so it will be brought forward for the board to approve at a later time. And the last part uh, is the uh, catch, still the catch health curriculum, but just so that um, you will know that this curriculum also addresses the uh, instruction on abuse prevention. And so it's, we didn't have to uh, look at a different curriculum. It was all inclusive in the same curriculum. And this will be the curriculum that will be presented. This agenda item will be presented 
uh, later this evening by our chief instructional officer. And uh, as I mentioned to you, making proud choices curriculum is uh, still under development and that will be brought forward to the board at a later time. So I want to thank our SHAC committee members, all of our parents and the individuals that serve on this committee. They've done a tremendous amount of work. Um, they've learned a lot and provided a lot of insight and support on how to improve um, our school district. And we are now recruiting, so um, I'm going to have a issue a shout out there to our parents who are interested in the committee um, and that have a children in our school district. They're more than welcome to come forward, and I believe we'll be reaching out to our school principals for recommendations. And that is it. Does, does anyone have any questions with regard to the SHAC annual report? Board members. Um, Sandra, just one question. Do we have a, a list of certified CPA, people that have received their, their CPR? CPA. A CPR, a CPR certification, yes. that would be Melissa, um, excuse me, Lursley Mon, and our um, athletic trainer, have lists of all of the individuals in our school district that are CPR trained. Do we encourage additional personnel to add every year? <clears throat> we encourage um, in, our, in our campuses, anyone when they go through the training, if they would like to, they, they are, have to go through a, a trainer. And our priority, of course, are our school nurses that, that are CPR trained on staff. Okay. I, I just. You know, again, um, there's situations that come up, and a lot of times, you know, because of the distance, they're they're away from the nurses and so forth, especially the sports areas. Okay, anyone else? We're done. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Okay, next item we have is item nine on the agenda. It's a consent agenda. Again, one action will approve all items on the agenda. Doctor, do you have a question? Uh, Mr. Rossi, just. Uh request that the board table item G6 from the consent agenda item. Okay. Item G6. Consideration to approve contract over $5,000 to MSB, school services. Again, funding source, general funds for medical, uh, Medicaid consult, uh, consultation and billing services related to school health and related services, SHARS. So we'll table that one. Again, if anyone has a question on any item, um, Shoalindo. It's not so much a question. I'm just going to ask Dr. Trios just to clarify, um, in case anybody follows the agenda. Can you explain where the money for the bus is coming from, as far as it's a grant and how much it would actually save the district in the amount of years, like we had discussed, with getting these buses and how it does benefit the district? Yes, sir. The the buses are being purchased 100% from a federal grant, 100%. Uh, now, the amount of the cost of the buses is uh, a lot larger than a normal bus would be. So in terms of savings to the district, this is how we would look at it. If we were to purchase two to three buses a year, the budget for purchasing those buses would be uh, right around, per year, uh, close to $375,000. So in buying 15 buses over the next five years, that turns out to be in real dollars for the district, about you know, 1.5, uh, uh, depending on how the prices go up, to $2 million. Now the part that we're not able to measure is the fuel consumption. Uh, we're not able to measure that. Mm -hmm. But it is entirely uh, free to the district. Not only does it uh, save us money on the long run, it also uh, allows us to have uh, new buses immediately replace old buses. The maintenance uh, is immeasurable because new buses don't require Corrective maintenance, only preventive maintenance. That's another large amount of savings. 
uh, in terms of mechanics being able to spend time on, on certain topics. There's a whole lot of, of savings that we can't measure yet because uh, we're not there with them, but it is going to be a whole lot of savings, and again, it's just free money okay. to the district. The Thank charging you. station that we will build to charge these buses uh, is also part of the, the grant funds. Okay. Thank you for that. Yes, so, regarding that topic, Dr. Rios, um, our destination with some of these buses will have those additional charging stations? No, sir. The, the buses, now there might be a time when Eagle Pass and Laredo has a charging station and uh, the fast charging buses can, can maybe get a boost before they make a round trip. But initially, the electric buses are only for in-town routes. Now what that does is that that allows us to use the newer uh, gas using buses uh, for out-of-town trips. So the newer buses are dedicated to out-of-town trips, but the electric buses are only for in-town use. Okay, okay. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. O'Farrell. I just wanted to touch on what you mentioned about the, the charging infrastructure um, there, because I know the grant was seven something million dollars. The the purchase is seven plus million dollars. Is that going to is the infrastructure going to come to us later for uh, approval? Because I mean, at depending on what kind of chargers we install, whether they're level two or level three, um, the the voltage and and the what has to come into that yard is going to require some huge upgrades. So is that included in that 7.3 or that will come to us later? Because, I mean, we'll get the buses, but then we need to charge them. Yes, sir. The, the, the PO will be sent out tomorrow for the buses, and then uh, Mr. Cabello, Mr. Chapa, and Mr. Carrera will work with Ms. Johnson to launch the RFP for the installation of the charging station and what we expect for the vendors to present to us. Uh, both uh, Mr. Cabello and Mr. Chapa have already been in contact with AEP for the additional load that needs to come into the, to the bus depot uh -huh. uh, to make sure that all that is provided for. They, they've, they've been doing a whole lot of work uh, in preparing for that. Uh, the first step is to announce the type of buses because then those individuals that are going to bid for the construction of the charging station need to know the type of buses that we're buying so that they uh, can then design the charging station in accordance with it. But yes, sir, that's th that will hopefully be coming to you all within the next uh, couple of months. And again, they've already worked with the people that uh, would bid on constructing the charging stations to be able to work backwards to make sure that the charging station is complete at the time the buses are delivered. Okay. Um, can, I, can I put Mr. Cabello on the spot? Mr. Cabello, once we send the purchase order for the buses, how long will it take for the first two or three buses to arrive? Nine months. And, and that'll be plenty of time to build the station. Okay, um, so I know we had looked at the, the company Thomas Built had sent one down and we looked at it. Um, what, are we, what are we buying? Are we buying Thomas Built? Are we buying Bluebirds? What are we buying? Let me invite Mr. Cabello to the podium along with Mr. Carrera. They're the ones that evaluated the, the RFP uh, and uh, they can speak to the selection. But I know it's not Thomas buses. It is the Bluebird. The Bluebird? Okay. Um, I know the Thomas built buses had the ability to, if we weren't using them over the weekend, uh, had the ability to dump, in, dump their battery storage back into the grid. Uh, and thus, you know, just like solar, uh, you sell it into the grid. Um, 
Do the, the bluebirds have the ability to to dump back into the grid? Yes, sir, they do. So and what the bluebirds that... give us that Thomas doesn't, sir, is bluebird, I'm sorry, Thomas forces us to use only level two chargers. Bluebird gives us the option of the level ones or level twos, which makes a huge difference in the price of the charging stations. Right, because I know as you move up, because I used to have an electric vehicle, as you move up level one, level two, you go from 110 to 220 to a DC fast charger, which is 440 something volts. Um, <clears throat> but the ability to, to, and that's something to look at in the, the future is, <clears throat> you know, in the summers when we're not running them all the time, is to sell back into the grid and uh, hopefully recoup, um, you know, money for the money for the district. You know, they're cut back on our electric bill. That is the plan, sir. Between the buses that we hope that is approved and the charging stations that we'll bring hopefully next month, that is exactly what we hope to do. Okay, and then probably even <clears throat> I'm sure there's some setup out there where if we go through the great snow apocalypse again uh, buses that are charged could be used to power different things within the the district like modern day rivians and teslas can and and stuff so exciting times <laughs> thank y'all anyone else i just want to keep in mind um, that when we transition over to make sure that um, our mechanics and maintenance people will keep up with, you know, again, um, the maintaining of those buses in regard to things that might, um, again, be broken or whatever, you know, just to make sure that we keep the training going up to individuals that will be uh, taking care of those buses. Okay. I'll go back again to the uh, consent agenda. There is a handout that was given to us because of the there's minutes of the January 23rd meeting. Um, again, one action item will approve all items in the consent agenda. For the sake of time, because this is a long agenda, we'll again post the donations on um, either Facebook or again um, on our website. We are again uh, thankful for all the donations that were made to our school district. And so, um, again, any questions on any item on the consent agenda that you need more clarification? Anyone? With no questions, then is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve with the one item being okay. tabled. Mr. Orfeld made a motion to approve with the one item that is being tabled, which is item 8B, district benchmark presentation. I'm sorry, G3 that G3 one G3 will be table, but um, the other one is item G6. G? G6. G6. Okay, that will come back to us later. Second, okay, seconded by Mr. Galindo. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. We go on to item 10, administration. First item that we have under 10 is 10A. Consideration to put the first reading of local policy update affecting policy F and F, local student rights and responsibilities, investigations and searches, Sandra Hernandez. Good evening once again, Mr. Mesa, Dr. Rios and members of the board. This particular policy is the policy on random student drug testing. The uh, recommended changes to this policy is to uh, address the increase in the number of cases of uh, the possession and or use of THC by students in grades 7 through 12. And uh, the district recommends amending the policy to require uh, to implement the random drug testing of students who are assigned to the DAEP, to the Alternative Center, uh, for violations of the Code of Conduct. And the students will be subject to such random testing for THC during the duration of their assignment to the DAEP. Questions from board members? Yes, Ms. Orfeld. I guess more of a comment or concern. THC oil, when used in a vape device, 
it was a state jail felony. Uh, there, uh, and I know one of my fellow board members is a, a peace officer. So that's a state jail felony, um, and <clears throat> which carries up to two years, I think, um, for the liquid and then for the device itself. Um, seeing an increase in the number of our students or, or in, in across the state, it's not just here, going in and, and using that. Um, since that is a state jail felony, are, are we seeing any movement from our district attorney to prosecute any of, of, of that stuff? Or, because uh, I know we, we talked about change, uh, some of this was about changing the time they were going to the DAP um, <clears throat> because nobody's getting prosecuted for a state jail felony. Uh, there, so. Um, Dr. Hughes? Is, is the law side of the community doing anything? Not PD. I'm talking about the prosecutorial, <laughs> prosecutorial side. Yeah. Doing anything up to, to help us drive home a point. If you do this crap, you're going to get in trouble and not just a little slap on the hand and go to alternative, then you get to come back. Yeah. Sorry. So, Mr. Overfelt, um, Actually, Mr. Lalino looks like he wants to answer. Well, good <laughs> answer. <laughs> we have, uh, when we first started dealing with THC, it, it was a, a huge, obviously a huge concern. What the district did is that we started installing vape devices. So now if you look at the news in the urban districts, there's a whole lot of districts being celebrated for installing these um, vape sensors. Um, and uh, yet we've been doing it for over, over a year. And because we had been doing it for well over a year, we, uh, we were catching a lot of students. And we were sending them to the DAP as if they were being sent to the DAP in lieu of expulsion. And we were sending the reports of uh, the process, but the DA has a higher um, requirement for prosecution. DAs across the state talked to uh, the state and said, hey, you know, to, to be able to prosecute, you know, this is, this is what we need to be able to prove. It would basically involve sending the, the, the oil to a different lab, uh, then it coming back, and, and it was, it's just a higher, higher th uh, threshold. The state then went back and said, hey, if you catch any kids with THC, by the way, it's not an expellable offense. It is a, uh, what we would consider mandatory placement. So then we had to go back and clear up the data. Uh, that's why the local, uh, and I, I shouldn't even use the word local, that's why DAs across the state are not moving forward. So then what we want to do, uh, because it's still a problem, uh, we want to uh, be able to offer an early release to kids that go there for THC if they do two things. One, if they submit to counseling, and two, if they, uh, if their parents agree uh, in writing a consent to, to having weekly uh, tests. So they're no longer random tests, they're just weekly tests. Voluntary. If you went there for THC, if, if you want to be able to go back to campus in 45 days instead of 90 days, then for 45 days you, you, you got to pop clean. Uh, so that's why we're bringing the policy. L long answer to, to your point, Mr. Oldfield. Okay, thank you. And as you all know, um, with all the devices that we have, some of the schools were considered unsafe, uh, which is something that needs to go away because of, uh, again, changes that will come about when we appeal that. Well, actually, Mr. Russell, yeah. we appealed it, and uh, the state came back and said, uh, you're cleared. So okay, we, we were granted our appeal. Yeah. Great. Yes. I'm glad. Um, with, again, um, the different conversations that a superintendent sat with the commissioner. I think this is something that's good that's come out of it. <clears throat> okay, so. I'll need to read the recommendation. Yes, recommendation, please. <clears throat> it is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the first reading of local policy update 
affecting policy FNF local student rights and responsibilities, investigations and searches as presented. Correct the recommendation. Is there a motion for approval? Mr. Valindo, seconded by Becky Chavez. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. We go on to item 10B, consideration to approve the first reading of TASB policy update 120, affecting policies <coughs> CB local, CK local, CKC local, FNG local, and FO local. Sandra Hernandez. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, this group of policies is a TASB policy update, which has a few of the policies for recommendations. Uh, TEA recommends that newly uh, recommends new text in CB local, which requires the district to give public notice of federal grant applications by providing information at board meetings and publishing information on the district's website. In CKC local, the new text has been included to comply with the education code, which requires the district's multi-hazard emergency operations plan to include protocols for responding to a train derailment near a school if a district facility is, when a, is within a thousand yards of a railroad track. And then new recommended local policy in FNG local incorporates compliant processes to clarify new special education complaints that are being addressed uh, it encompasses all instructional resources policies and references the required hearing procedure for eligibility disputes under school nutrition programs. And then the last of the policies, FO local, is to clarify circumstances when restraint may be used generally and to more prominently, prominently address restraint of a student who receives special education services. And you have the draft policies right behind this agenda. Just as a reminder to board members, we do have a policy committee that has reviewed these and has gone through the different changes and asked questions, but if you have any further questions, Now's the time. Hearing no questions, recommendation please. Yes, sir. It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the first reading of TASB Policy Update 120, affecting policy CB local, state and federal revenue sources, CKC local, safety program risk management, emergency plans, FNG local student rights and responsibilities, student and parent complaints and grievances, and FO local student discipline, local policy updates affecting policies FNF local, student rights and responsibilities, investigations as presented. You heard the recommendation from administration. Now we entertain a motion for approval. Motion made by Becky Chavez, seconded by Amy Haynes, all those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Next item we have is 10C, consideration to approve the San Felipe de Oro CISD policy, uh, Police Department Policy Manual, Sandra Hernandez. Yes, sir. Law enforcement agencies are required to provide essential services to foster safe communities through crime reduction and deterrence, and what our school district has done like many other enforcement agencies, is they, they're obligated to train and supervise and guide our local law enforcement personnel in performing a variety of tasks. This manual has been put together so that, um, this, uh, so that our officers are well-versed on the procedures, uh, training, um, and steps that are needed to take um, for law enforcement. And, and uh, supporting our the functions of the law enforcement agency in our district. Mr. Bess, I've asked the uh, Chief Foss, our <coughs> Chief of Police, to come to the podium and uh, to elaborate answer on. any questions that y'all may have. Okay. I'll ask board members if you have any questions at this time. Mr. Chief Foss, Mr. Orfield. 
just a 90 second recap of, of, of what that manual dictates for y'all. So <clears throat> it's like any other uh, thing, we need rules and guidelines to, to function as, as a department. Uh, for as long as I've been here, um, we haven't had that. And so the most perfect example that I can give you is active shooter. Um, the district does have an active shooter policy, but it's for the district. The police department needs its very own active shooter uh, policy that will dictate and guide what the things that we as police officers must do in a situation. So on that, on that note, um, <clears throat> the, the district has its active shooter policy and, and now District PD will have that. Uh, I know Southwest Texas Junior College greatly increased its police force in the aftermath of May 24th and <clears throat> we now have an armed officer on our campus here uh, and they were required to go to active shooter training. They're have our members or will our officers uh, go through, be required to go through active shooter um, situation scenarios training? Yes, sir. All of our officers have already uh, gone through active shooter uh, alert training. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as this week alone, I have one of my uh, sergeants is attending uh, alert training to become an active shooter um, instructor and so now I'll have two on staff and we can uh, provide our own training and um, the plan is that at least every summer to have uh, we're only required a, an eight-hour class um, but at least have a, a refresher and it's also outlined in our MOU with the sheriff's office and the police department to to have active shooter training together so that we're all on the same page. Excellent, thank you. Chief Oz, I have a couple of questions before I turn it over to some of the others. Uh, shields and other um, firearm uh, have high capacity, um, I guess, ammunition and, and cartridge or whatever. Uh, are those specific to certain positions? Are they, a, I mean, like the rifles, I have seven rifles and the way we've distributed them is um, by vehicles. So seven, seven, seven rifles, seven vehicles, seven shields, seven vehicles. Um, I just received the entry tools um, uh, yesterday. So uh, we're going to put those out there and our helmets are still pending. Um, they need to be manufactured fresh, so it's it's taking its time to, to get the equipment in there, but that's how we we have them. Okay, you and will then, keep inventory of that? Yes, sir. And then the rifles, everybody ha everybody who's carrying a rifle um, and is assigned a unit uh, has to be qualified by, by TECO standards for that rifle. Okay, I know um, Ms. Webb had a question. Yes, uh, this weekend I mailed or texted Dr. Rio several several questions and I believe he addressed them with you. But my question right now is a lot of our officers have had training, but can we get a list of all the officers and what training each one of them has had in order for them to be in compliance with the uh, in incident command system and as far as any LEMI training that they have received or what training have all of our officers received and what are they in need of? So as I explained before, if the officer attended a police academy uh, here with the Durham Police Department with the Sheriff's Office, and I think it has to do with grant funding, uh, the academy uh, puts on those classes so that each officer has the incident command uh, classes, uh, 100, 200, 300, the 700, um, but it's not required by TCOL. It's not, a, it's not a requirement for, for TCO licenses. They just do it so that everybody's in compliance for, for federal standards. Um, and that goes back, I mean, I can check when was the last time the, uh, the class wasn't put on, but I think it goes back up to the early 2000s when they were, they were putting that class on. And, and uh, that was from 
both agencies. Um, so I'm, I'm as sorry. far as it being a requirement, I mean, we I'm can. Sorry, Chief. Sorry to interrupt. The, the answer is yes, ma'am. We'll provide a list of the training uh, that they've done, whether they're required or not, so that then we can tailor a, a plan to provide trainings to those who don't have certain trains that may be required. But to see what they need so that all of them are in compliance and everybody knows what the left hand is doing and what the right hand is doing, more, more or less. We'll provide a report, ma'am. It'll take us a while to put it together, but if you, if you give us uh, 30 days, we'll, we'll definitely provide that if you have a board update. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Okay. I appreciate all the work that goes into, again, having procedural man. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's needed. And again, thank you for all the contributions from everyone involved. Okay. With that being said, any other questions? If not, we'll ask for the recommendation. Senator will read it. Yes, sir. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the San Felipe Dorio CISD Police Department <coughs> Policy and Procedures Manual and grant the superintendent and the chief of police future authority to amend the policy manual in order to comply with any changes in law or TCO requirements that may happen in later years. For the recommendation from administration, I'll entertain a motion for approval. The Honorable Sanders made a motion, seconded by Ms. Orfeld. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Item 10D. Discussion of possible action to donate surplus property to other charitable and or educational facilities or entities. Dr. Rios. Yes, Mr. Mesa, members of the board, in preparation for transitioning the North Heights uh, staff to Sinisa Hills and the Cardwell staff to North Heights, uh, the district has bought new furniture for both facilities. In the past, we have stored the furniture uh, for long periods of time, whether it be at the uh, old Travis campus or even at uh, the old Garfield campus and other places throughout. Uh, unfortunately, this furniture doesn't sell um, very quickly, and we continue to just build up a whole lot of items for storage. Because we've already purchased new furniture for Sanisa Hills and purchased uh, new furniture for Cardwell transition to North Heights, what we would like to do, in, uh, considering that the furniture will have uh, really no value to the district, rather than wait and store the furniture, we'd like to do things in this manner. First, we would like to obviously offer the furniture to any of the campus who might need a desk a uh, teacher's desk or, or, or any nice filing cabinet of any sort to our staff. Uh, but once our staff has said, okay, this is, uh, the, we, don't, we don't need it, we don't, we don't want it, then we want to first offer it as a gift, because it would cost us more to, to, to store it, offer it as a gift to the different uh, local entities, whether they be uh, church groups, charter schools, private schools, daycares and then once they come they take all the furniture that they want then we will transition all the furniture to one location uh, to cardwell uh, because that would be a storage facility after the summer and then and then move to auction it uh, and, and hopefully a lot of it will be will be taken but it's been difficult and, and it just takes it's it's a whole lot of storage space because now we're talking about two full buildings uh, being stored into in, into one uh, building. So uh, that's our recommendation that you allow us, considering that it will cost more to store it, that you allow us to first gift it and then try to auction whatever is left uh, before we dispose of anything. Any questions? Questions from board members? Okay. Then recommendation, Dr. Lewis. Mr. Mesa, members of the board, it is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the older furniture at North Heights Elementary and Cardwell Elementary to be deemed as no valid to the district and of no use to other district campuses or office locations and allow for these items to be donated and or disposed of. 
for the recommendation. There's a motion by Mr. Galindo, seconded by Amy Haynes. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next item we have is item 11A, consideration to approve the submission of an application to the Texas Education Agency, TA, for a low attendance day waiver. Uh, Ida Gomez, Michelle Smith. Good evening, Mr. Metza, Dr. Rios, members of the board. In accordance with the Student Attendance Accounting Handbook, section 3.8.1.4, low attendance day waivers, a school district may apply for a low attendance day waiver for a day in which school was held, but attendance was at least 10 percentage points below the overall average attendance rate for the district or the applicable campus for the prior year due to weather-related health or safety issues. A winter storm warning calling for significant icing beginning late afternoon January 31st, 2023 through early morning of February 2nd, 2023 was issued for Val Verde County. Due to the winter storm warning on Wednesday, February 1st, 2023, the following campuses experienced attendance rates below the 10% threshold established by TEA. Those campuses were Blended Academy, Garfield Elementary, North Heights Elementary, Lamar Elementary, Irene Cardwell Elementary, and Ruben Chavita Elementary. Administration is requesting permission to apply for the low attendance day waiver for the designated campuses. Question from board members? I just have one, uh, Mrs. Smith. <clears throat> have we been successful at every attempt for waiver uh, days from TA? For low attendance day waivers? Yes. Yes, sir. We applied for one um, back in August of this year. Um, once again, for a weather-related event, there was flooding. So we were granted? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad we're doing this <laughs> because, again, we need all the assistance we can get. Again, we understand that uh, conditions, you know, again, with the weather alert, that helps us, um, you know, get the, the information uh, needed for uh, absences to be, uh, again, dismiss and therefore have a process to do that. So recommendation, we, we don't have any other questions. It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approves the submission of the application to TEA for a low attendance day waiver for the selective campuses. With the recommendation from administration, I'll entertain a motion for approval, motion made by Amy Haynes, <coughs> seconded by Ms. Gonzalez. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Item 11B, consideration to approve the Catch Health Ed Journeys curriculum recommended by the School Health Advisory Council, Shack Ida Gomez. Good evening, President Mesa, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. The Texas Education Agency requires a health curriculum for all kindergarten through eighth grade students. The goal of health education is to provide instruction that allows youth to develop and sustain health-promoting behaviors throughout their lives. The understanding and application of these standards will allow students the ability to gather, interpret, and understand health information. In kindergarten through eighth grade, students will gain an understanding of health information and skills through the following five strands. Physical health and hygiene, mental health and wellness, healthy eating and physical activity, injury and violence prevention and safety, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. In the state of Texas, the Catch Health Ed Journeys curriculum covers 100% of the required health education TEKS for grades kindergarten through eighth grade. The program includes 36 weekly lessons, which will be delivered by teachers in elementary and through PE or elective courses in middle schools. As Ms. Hernandez noted, we, there is a second component to fourth through eighth grade for the um, reproductive and sexual health. We will be bringing that to the board at a later time. For tonight, um, we are asking the recommendation for the health curriculum, which is the required TEKS for kinder through eighth grade. Are there any questions? 
Yes, ma'am. Yes, we, Becky Charles. Yeah, sorry. Um, so this uh, curriculum would be taught by both the teacher and the physical ed teacher, or just the teachers? In, in elementary school, kinder, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth grade, it's part of the teacher curriculum. Teacher curriculum. Yes, ma'am. Okay. In sixth, seventh, and eighth, because we have elective courses and PE full coaches, it could be taught through there also. It could be. Yes, ma'am. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? Recommendation, please. Yes, sir. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the kindergarten through eighth grade catch health ed journeys curriculum recommended by the SHAC. The recommendation is there a motion for approval? A motion made by Ms. Gonzalez, seconded by Becky Chavez. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we go to human resources item 14 on the agenda. First item we have is item A discussion possible action to approve employee job descriptions and evaluation forms by Dave Garcia. Good evening once again, President Mesa, Dr. Rios, members of the board. In your board packet, we are recommending uh, two updates for custodian and head custodian. What we're recommending to update is under working conditions to include the weight that they're required to lift. This comes in handy when employees are eager to come back to work after medical leave or workers comp, and a lot of times the doctor gives some restrictions, so we need to go by their job responsibility to know whether they can come back or not. So this is gonna be clear for that purpose. That appears in blue highlighted and yes, job description. Any questions on those two items? So that's more specific. Yes, Just sir. that's all we're getting. Okay. Any questions? We're good. Okay, recommendation. It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the employee job description and evaluation forms as discussed. For the recommendation, is there a motion for approval? Motion made by Mr. Galindo, seconded by Linda Webb. All those in favor? Motion carries in Thank you. Item 14B, consideration to approve the submission of the 2023 or 2022 2023 request for maximum class size waiver exemption to TA by De Garcia. Yes, sir. As you are aware, the school districts are required to conduct a class size survey, and we do this every month to see if there's any classrooms that are over the 22 to 1 ratio. We have identified Ruben Chavira Elementary to be um, 23 to one, first grade, a general ed classroom. And then also Bobby Barrera Elementary, fourth grade, 23 to one, also a general ed classroom. So we are recommending for the board to allow us to file a class size waiver exception to TEA. Any questions? Any questions? No, no questions, recommendation please. It is a recommendation of administration that the Board of Trustees approve the submission of the 2022-2023 request for maximum class size waiver exception to TEA and the compliance plan. Correct the recommendation of entertain a motion for approval. Motion made by Mr. Galindo, seconded by Amy Haynes. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Next item we have is 14C, consideration to approve the updated 2022-2023 district compensation plans by Vic Garcia. Yes, there is one small change that we want to recommend to update on the part-time temporary pay, and that is under homebound. We are recommending to bring that up to $40 uh, instead of 25 and this this would be in alignment with the miscellaneous per hour for extra duty pay for teachers 
Any questions? Any questions? Hearing none, recommendation, please. It is a recommendation of administration that the Board of Trustees approve the updated 2022-2023 district compensation plan as presented. Heard the recommendation, now will entertain a motion for approval. Motion made by Becky Chavez, seconded by Mr. Galindo. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the time is 8.16 p.m. We have, um, we're going to close session, item 17. We're going to close session pursuant to policy 551.074 and 551.071. Again, uh, we are going to close session and no action will be taken. If action is required, we'll be reconvening in open session and taking action upon um, reconvening. We're now in closed session.
Okay, the time is 11.28 p.m. We're reconvening into open session. No action was taken in executive session. We're down to item 18 on our agenda. Item 18A, consideration to approve the personnel report to include the following. New hires, district vacancies, retirements, resignations. Hey there, Garcia. Good evening, once again, President Mesa, Dr. Rios, members of the board. Excuse me. It is the recommendation for administration that the Board of Trustees approve the resignations and vacancies at per as presented in closed session. With the recommendation, is there a motion for approval? Mr. Galindo, seconded by Amy Haynes. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Item 18B, consideration to approve the position of bilingual slash ESL director for the bilingual ESL department. Aide Garcia. Yes, sir. It is a recommendation of administration that the Board of Trustees approve Ms. Karen Schaefer as the bilingual ESL education program director for the curriculum and instruction department. Thank you very much. I'll entertain a motion for approval. Motion made by Becky Chavez, seconded by Mrs. Gonzalez. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Item 18C, consideration to approve teacher contracts. Aide Garcia. Yes, sir. It is the recommendation of administration that the Board of Trustees approve the following teacher contracts. Non-Chapter 21 probationary, 10. Non-Chapter 21 term 1, 2. Probationary, 101. Term 2, 66. And term 3, 88 for a total of 267. Thank you. You've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion for approval? Motion made by Mrs. Webb. Seconded by Ms. Orfeld. All those in favor? Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Item 18E, consideration to approve salary adjustments. Are they Garcia? Did we do the professional already or no? No. Item D, consideration to approve administrator and professional contracts. It is a recommendation of administration that the Board of Trustees approve the following professional contracts. Non-Chapter 21 probationary, 20. Non-Chapter 21 term 2, 5. Non-Chapter 21 term 3, 8. Probationary, 5. Term 2, 4. And term 3, 37 for a total of 79. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion for approval. Mr. Orfeld, seconded by Ms. Gonzalez. All those in favor? Motion carries. Item 18E, consideration to approve salary adjustments. It is a recommendation of administration that the Board of Trustees approve the salary adjustment as discussed in closed session. Read the recommendation. Is there a motion? Motion made by Becky Chavez, seconded by Mr. Galindo. All those in favor? Motion carries. You voted, right, Becky? Yes. You voted, right? Okay. Motion. Thank you. Carries the items. Okay, in the matter of uh, level three grievance concerning Carolina Galindo, is there a motion? I'm sorry, Mr. Mesa. Give me one second. You were, you're right. I was wrong. Go okay. We're going um, on the agenda, um, uh, on the list of grievances there. F, item F, is there a, a motion in the matter of level three grievance concerning Carolina Galindo? Hearing none, administration decision at level one stands. In the matter of uh, level three grievance, item G, Concerning Cristina Hernandez, grievance, is there a motion? Hearing none, the decision made by administration at level one stands. 
in the matter item H, H in the level three uh, grievance, Yarixa Espinosa. Is there a motion? Hearing none, the decision made by administration stands at the level one. Item L, item I, in the matter of level three grievance concerning Yvette Cordoba, is there a motion? Hearing no motions, the matter at uh, level one, decision by administration stands. Item J, level three grievance concerning Sherry Galindo, is there a motion? Hearing no motions, the decision made by administration, level one, stands. Item K, level three grievance concerning Cindy Cardenas, is there a motion? Hearing none, decision made by administration at the level one stands. L, level three grievance in the matter of Monica Fernandez, is there a motion? Hearing none, decision by administration at level one stands. At this time, there's no other items on the uh, Agenda, is there a motion for adjournment? Motion made by Mrs. Webb, seconded by Mr. Overfeld. All those in favor? Unanimously, we are adjourned. Thank you, good night, everyone.